Welcome to Post Doom, regenerative conversations exploring overshoot grief, grounding, and gratitude. I'm your host, Michael Dowd. And in this conversation with Dina Metzger, we explore at a slower pace than many of my other conversations. Dina is a, is a wise woman, a crone, and she's a novelist, an essayist, a healer, teacher, a truly an amazing uh, eco saint of these days. She's a mentor to Krista Heiser, one of my favorite post doom conversationalists. And my wife, Connie Barlow, added uh, text and image overlays. And so I just invite you to relax and, and take this in. Uh, we started with heartbreak and uh, appropriately so in these times. I'm going to start with heartbreak. Yeah. And um, we're all thinking too much. Mm. And we're completely fascinated with our ideas and our understanding. So I think we have to start with the heartbreak. And um, <clears throat> You said something in one of the little videos that I browsed um, about talking to the animals. You said a few things. You said, um, you know, we're not talking to the to the animals or or the water or the air, and um, you said something about progress. Uh, an evolution. I, I want to get away from all of that, from yes. progress mm -hmm. and from evolution. Um, ecology is a it is is so much, but it's also if we look at it, if we understand it, it's a way of understanding relationship, and so. Um, what do all these words really mean? So what does it mean to talk to the animals? I went outside, you know, to, to pray uh, before um, we talked that what we say together might mean something. Right? And the prayer is essentially the same. May this world, I live at the edge of a state park, um, may this little place <clears throat> thrive. May it be a sanctuary for all beings. <clears throat> May it be a seed. You know, the, the Big Bang was a seed, right? Everything, whole future was in it. And then it opened. And we think of its explosive nature, but actually, it's just a seed opening into vast, unbelievable beauty. So my question is, how do we live really? It's a word you use, really. <laughs> how do we live really in relationship to that? What does that mean about every single moment? So this is a very special day for me because there, there's, a, there's a moment when you dedicate a series to your granddaughter. And she's sitting on your shoulder. So, you know. Yes. Um, so my granddaughter's partner had a little boy yesterday. Oh my so gosh, I'm yesterday. A great Right. I, I mean, I'm still reeling just a few hours ago, you know. William Brady Anderson. And so 
I have to consider the future. Um, the children need a future, which means they need an earth. But the polar bear mother also wants to be a great grandmother. And the bears and the elephants and the spiders and so on. And to understand that there is an intelligence beyond us and to yield to it and try to take it in, that feels so important to me. Mm -hmm. And getting out of our heads. Getting. So I use a term um, that I've developed, heart mind. Heart? Heart mind. Oh yes, heart mind, yes, exactly. Heart mind. So how do we live in terms of heart mind? How, do, how is every decision made, not on what we think, but out of heart mind? Yeah. Um, what an indigenous person says, has said many times, you know, we don't think with the mind, we think with the heart. So I'm trying to understand this mm -hmm. as a non-indigenous woman, mm -hmm. but um, what is that intelligence? So when I found myself eye to eye with an elephant who clearly walked down a path to talk to me, faced me, mm -hmm. turned his trunk inside out, and then moved to me close enough that he could put his trunk around my neck and looked in my eyes mm. 30 minutes. Mm. That was a mystery. How did we meet there? It was no accident. His agency and understanding and something beyond us. You know, so religion for me never gets it. Yes. I, <laughs> you know, I want to say to them, you don't get it. It is so awesome. And if we understood how awesome it was, if we yielded to it, if we gave ourselves to it, then maybe we could come out of this horrific situation that we have created. Do you really believe that still? I get that you've believed that as have I most of my life, but I, I do not believe that any transformation of consciousness can help us avoid the age of consequences that we're already in. Uh, do you really believe that? Avoid it? No, we have to step into it. But then yeah. we're, do we're doing it. Yeah, exactly. We're doing it mm -hmm. and to take responsibility for it. Yes. I don't want to let anyone off the hook. Yeah, no, I get it. I, I get it. They say they're depressed. <laughs> Tell that to the polar bear mother whose yeah. ice is melting. I mean, <laughs> really, give me a break. <laughs> the way you're living, stop it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Change your life, change your mind think differently well uh, i'm so grateful that you used exactly that phrase because literally yesterday i finished listening i had uh, actually john englander who is a dear friend and colleague he's probably the most knowledgeable person in the world at least in the english-speaking world on the the rising oceans he wrote a book called high tide on main street and i interviewed him and he he recommended uh wayne dyer's book from quite a long time ago change your mind change your life which is really about the Tao Te ching it's, you know, and, and so I just experienced that and just finished literally yesterday. Uh, and it was like being immersed in the, in the Tao Te Ching, which I've, I've 
felt the part of my soul being Taoist for actually almost 30 years now. So it was a real treat. So I'm just thrilled that you just used exactly that language. Well, that's the word I've, I've been using. That's the work that I've been doing. How can we change our minds? And how do our minds need to need to change? Where are our values mm -hmm. just implicit in everything we do? First of all, how important we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we get rid of that, you know. Um, we're not the pinnacle. Exactly. And there aren't it pinnacles. Ecology will tell you that everything is interrelated, everything is interconnected. Ecology as a as a way of knowing which is of course what native american tribes each in their own way know so profoundly um well if i were gonna I, guess about wh what species would i nominate for pinnacle i'd probably put uh dolphins uh bonobos and elephants <laughs> there, you go. there you go but you know they're all connected right they can't that's what a keystone species is if it's not there the, the system doesn't work exactly. so um maybe more to the point what what animal are you do you have an animal intelligence that, you know, like maybe be, I mean, I've often said mostly to young people because they understand more of it. Well, you know, I'm an elephant. Amen. And to some extent I have elephant mind, mm -hmm. or I have been willing to try to understand what would that be? Can I, respond to situations as an elephant might respond can i get to know that mind i don't live among them so could i get to know that mind well enough and um i had an experience where i went to um tula tula which is a preserve in Southern Africa that was started by Lawrence Anthony, who you may know, wrote a book called The Elephant Whisperer, created mm -hmm. a preserve for a rogue group of herd of elephants, um, who then, whenever he went to travel and he came home, they were waiting for him. Yeah. yeah. How did they know? Yeah, exactly. When he died and his wife is, um, in the house of reeling from the phone call who's about to get an award and he just died and his wife is reeling the elephants are outside how do they know what what is the nature of the world in such things when such things happen yes exactly and that's what I keep asking my students because mm -hmm. they will come to me. You know, we all have these events that we can't explain, mm -hmm. right? Or that we see things of just such beauty or wonder. Okay, what is the real nature of the world in which this exists and such things happen? How then will you live? Yeah. So, I went to Tula Tula for wandering foot. Okay. I went to Tula Tula. Um, Lawrence Anthony had died. Um, but I knew that I, that, that I had to be there. And I was told that I had to go in a certain way, the way I would go if I were going to visit uh, a tribal chief mm -hmm. um, and and so i had to ask permission mm -hmm. of the matriarch to be there and to be with them mm -hmm. and, and and 
promise to be respectful and to try to listen. Then. But if she wouldn't give me permission, I couldn't be there. So we travel and I tell this to the ranger mm -hmm. and I say to him, I think she called us, you know. Mm -hmm. And he, I understand he's in a dilemma. He's gonna bring these people to this elephant, right? And she trusts him, but clearly it could be bananas, right? So he does what he does. He takes us to a place and we sit there mm -hmm. and she comes mm -hmm. and she stops. So I speak to her and it seems we have permission mm -hmm. because we see her again and again and again. And vis-a-vis -vis science, I say to her, I'm not an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. I am here to honor you mm -hmm. and to try to communicate so that my species starts behaving in, in some way to indicate who you reveal yourself to be. So if we change your, our minds, will we have a future? I don't know. If we don't change our minds, will we have a future? No. No, exactly. Because everything we're doing and everything we're thinking, including our finest thinking, yeah. is taking us to extinction. Yes. And climate collapse. Yes. Because we're mad. Yes. Right? We're insane. Yes, exactly. I don't know. And I think some of our finest thinking brought us there. Absolutely. Right? Right. So, heartbreak again. Yes, heartbreak, right. Yeah. Yeah. That was great. Well, I know that you have spent time and effort and energy and with your students and what you've written in terms of 19 ways for a viable future for all beings. And I'd love for you to share that because um, I, I so align with what you've written there. And yet there's a piece of me that is like, well, I fully agree. And I no longer have the faith or the trust or the belief that a, um, uh, a a thriving future for all beings is even possible. I think it's it's you know, I think things are collapsing and things are collapsing in a cascading, ever faster way, and that there's more likelihood. In, I'd put it at a ninety percent plus chance that there will be few mammals larger than something that can burrow under the ground in the next forty or fifty years than that. Uh, then that all beings will thrive a hundred years or a thousand years or a million years from now. I mean, maybe a million years, <laughs> life, life will recover. Uh, you know, I call it compost theology. Life will, nature, you know, regenerates that. That's what will happen over time with or without us. So I'd love for you to just speak to, you know, what are some of the things that you hold as most sacred both in terms of, you've already shared some in terms of the present, but also in terms of these, you know, a viable future for all beings, anything that you'd like to share on that and how, if at all, your understanding or articulation of that has shifted since you uh, originally uh, uh, wrote that. You know, it's so interesting. Um, I hear what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Our survival is not primary 
for me because it was so vicious, cruel, self-centered, mad. We're all so beautiful, but it's not enough. To Matt, you know, I just care about the earth and I am and 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 the natural world. But if I don't give everything that I have, mm-hmm. every single moment to living in the right way and involved with restoration, then I haven't met my responsibility and uh, what uh, the native uh, writer Stan Rushworth says, the obligation yes. to um, to my life and, 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 and to the planet and to spirit. Yes. I have an obligation. Yes. And I'm just going to come back to the wonder because the wonder of of the being and, and life and such is so extraordinary that I have to say I don't understand it. And so I just, I don't know if this answers, but... Um, You know, the 19 ways they came to me. I'm the last person in the world to have 19 ways. We say, well, you you work on this, you work on that. But they came to me. Okay, I'll do it. Whatever you say, (laughs) whoever you are. I didn't think of them. But I watch people's mind change as they work them as they try to understand them over years. And so I bless it and I give my time to it. Yeah. Well, what did you mean by the fifth way for people who aren't familiar? Because that was your earlier articulation of that. Uh, The fifth fifth, world. Fifth world, fifth world, right. That um, whether you're in Judaism or you're in Native American thought, there are four worlds and, you know, there was a progression. And then there was a fifth world in which people lived in right relationship to um, to the natural world, in right reality, relationship yes, to, to, to our To our living Well, if you imagine yourself, we're looking in reality. There you go. That's it. So if you live as if, Ordinary person for anyone that's a relationship. Say say that again. You cut out just a second. Uh, if you live right. as if, if you live as if we're in that world where we are in right relationship, yes. and. Everything thrives because it's interconnected and interdependent. And because we step out of that mind um, that says, uh, the fungi are really self-interested and the trees are self-interested and they look at everything through a capitalist you know, science looks at things through a capitalist model. Can we step out of that? Let's live as if we're at, as if we're in right relationship. Yeah. Let's live. Let's look at how trees and animals live. Yes. And not impose our own vicious, self-centered ego way on it but really look at it and then live that way yes yeah um but i don't know michael 
You give all this yeah. time. You're spending your whole your, your, your whole life doing this. Why are you doing that? Because ecology is ecology is my theology. Ecology, the body of life as a divine being that I'm a part of, that I'm utterly dependent upon, and that I share with all other creatures. That is so um, uh, sacred, so meaningful to me that I can't think of another way to live my life right. other than to help people fall more deeply in love with life. And for many people in the, in the Western religious traditions, for the first time, perhaps, yeah. because they've had an otherworldly or supernatural understanding of the divine rather than this biosphere, this cosmos is itself our biophysical creator, sustainer, and end. So inviting people to fall in love with this reality and to be of service to this reality and trust the future, including a future that may not include us, but that's okay. We can still be deeply in love in our, what I call post doom, no gloom, love and action. Right. And not act, ask, is this helping? Is this really, will it, you know, forget it. Right now, what I care about is that the beauty, I'm devoted to the beauty of it. Yes, oh. It's so amazing and the wonder of it. I had a fortunate experience a few weeks ago um, where uh, I was given a gift of uh, mushrooms mm -hmm. and um, I sat under a group of eucalyptus trees mm -hmm. right outside here. And the leaves met and the color light broke into color yeah. and the beauty was beyond yes and so that came from the natural world mm -hmm. that gift absolutely right <laughs> look yeah. spend this time this is reality yes now We'll show it to you. Yeah. This is sacred. Serve it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Well, I mean, clearly you derive your joy, your inspiration, your soul nourishment, to use that kind of language from the the living world from the ecological reality in which we are all embedded that's right and that's right. you have found places through your writing and through your teaching and through your you know mentoring others uh of passing on that which has been grace gifted to you uh on to others uh, to the best you're able how do you yourself and then how do you share with others um stay i mean i can actually intuit some of your response to this already but to how do you stay inspired how do you stay positive how do you stay on purpose how do you stay uh with joy and gratitude um in the midst of a world that is clearly insane in a culture a civilization that's clearly declining in a in a biosphere and a climate regime that's clearly wigging out so how do you not deny any of that but ultimately come from a place of 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 heartful connection to the whole and how do you support others uh in this process you know i realized i have to go somewhere else um, because I also look very deeply at the other reality of how, of, of what we've done. And that's part of my process of not looking away for one second. So when I wrote the book, The Other Hand, I actually had gone to yes. the death camps. Yes. And um, 
I spent uh, I spent a month sitting in meditation on uh, uh, in furnaces in gas chambers. I spent the night at at the at the uh, nuns. Uh, sanctuary at Auschwitz. I slept in the bed that Cardinal Lustiger had slept in when he was there. And the book is directed. It's actually addressed to him. His mother died mm. in, uh, in Auschwitz in a gas chamber. And the character, the protagonist in the novel is a, um, an astronomer. So she knows the vastness and she goes mad. She follows, um, she follows an inner voice, an invading voice of a, um, of a Nazi. Mm. She follows what he did and what it was to be a guard and what he saw. But, but, so I don't, I, I have to say, first, we have to see things. We have to bear witness. Yes. Right? And then, and then the beauty, how did I get there where I allow the beauty to come in? I have to tell you a dream because I think the dream is um, essential. It was 1985, and I had just lost my very dearest friend, uh, a soulmate. Mm. And this voice had said to me, forgive those who want to leave early mm. because mm. they can't bear the pain mm. of being here. Just forgive them. So that night, I dreamed that I was in a clabbered house in some area, um, some prairie area. Um, there was nothing. Old white clabbered house. I'm looking out the window. It's devastated by a nuclear event. Mm -hmm. And I want to commit suicide because I can't bear it. And I go upstairs. I think I'm going to cut my wrists and in the bathtub that I hear is an easy way to commit suicide. There's this huge woman filling up the bathtub. So I can't get in it and I can't commit suicide. <laughs> I'm out of my mind. And so I'm just sitting there and I'm looking out the window and this little car, this Model T Ford comes traveling by and a man gets out of it. He's clearly Ethiopian. And he comes to the house. He has something he wants to ask. He's lost. I don't know what. And I think, okay, he'll help me commit suicide. <laughs> so he comes in the house and um, this voice says, um, make a child mm. and i say are you crazy do you know how <laughs> old i am and i'm not going to be able to get a test to see if the kid is okay or not and we've just had a nuclear devastation new life make a child mm. Mm. well that was 1985 <laughs> it's 15 
20, 35 years ago, 37 years ago. Mm -hmm. Life, life, honor, life, no matter what. Yeah. Even if you're my age, I'm 86, you know, I'm not going to be here that long. I'm going to die soon. Still, honor life. Yeah. And honor the spirits. Yes. So I think part of what's really important to me is that I can't deny the existence of spirit, of the mm. great mystery. Mm -hmm. of, and and so um, to know the existence of spirit not because of anything anyone told me or any liturgy or anything like that, but because of my experiences mm -hmm. and to help people have those kinds of experiences. Mm -hmm. That's what keeps me going. Yeah. 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 That's a great story and so powerful. It, it, it reminds me of two and a half, well, almost three years ago now, it's about three years ago now. Um, uh, in fact, three years ago, last month, now that I think about it, I was in Florida caring for my, supporting my nephew um, because my brother and sister-in-law had flown to England. And so I, I was there in support of, of my nephew. And I was really filled with a lot of fear and anxiety because my youngest daughter, who's now 32, she would have been 29 at the time. She and her husband had gotten married about a year earlier and I knew they were, they were wanting to have a child. And I was just filled with fear about, you know, bringing a child into the world at this time and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And this, I had this mystical experience. I had a, I, I was on MDMA and I had this incredible wave of trust that washed over me. And, um, and I just knew this knowing that went deeper than words or, or rationality that I could trust God, reality, the universe, nature, the living reality. And so I, I, call, I, I just, all of the fear that I had had just literally evaporated and was replaced with trust. And I did have the thought that if this is the last, you know, let's say worst case scenario, which is this is the last generation of women to have children. Would I really want my daughter to not have this incredibly sacred honoring experience and so i called her up and we just cried and cried and cried together and and <laughs> then um and then about two months later i found out that three weeks after we had had that conversation they got pregnant and now we have a two-year and three-month-old uh granddaughter and to what degree she needed her old man's blessings i have no idea but uh, what i do know is that our granddaughter has given, I mean, for every day or week that she will suffer, and sure, the suffering is a part of life, she will suffer. But for every day or week that she, of suffering, she has weeks and months and possibly years of joy and love to give and experience. And that's surely been true for the last, you know, two years and several months. And it's that it comes to that what you were just sharing in that story that no matter how bleak things seem to be, no matter what the context or situation, there's always this, this, this impulse among, among those of us that are awake to this of serving life, of, of, of generating, of, of, serving of, life. yes. Right. Serving life is sacred. Yes. And serving it. And, and thank you for also mentioning, because I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you if you would discuss whatever you wanted to, because you have more than most writers that, in my experience, you have had the opportunity to really be a witness to some of the great evils of, of the 20th century and some of the great horrific experiences. So, uh, you know, uh, say a little bit more about how those experiences have both shaped your writing but also just your heart, your soul. Well, a long time ago, uh, one, of, uh, one of my mentees, when I first met her, Danielia Wild, she said to me, does place make a difference when you're writing? 
right? And I place this at the core. Yes. And so, and when I make a pilgrimage, it's not necessarily to the holy place. You know, it's not to the Bodhi tree. It's to Hanford nuclear site, one of the 10 most polluted sites in the world that's um, at the border between Oregon and, yes, and, uh, and Washington State. Uh, the, the name of the river just went out of my mind. The, Columbia River. Thank you. It's at the Columbia, and it is so polluted. And the salmon, the native people, they catch the salmon and they hang them at night, you know, to dry for the winter. They shine at night. And when I was there, we were on a tour, and suddenly we were rushed out of this little place where we were, someone was given a talk and put back into the bus. And the next day I read in the newspaper that there had been a uh, nuclear energy had, had been released mm. exactly where we were. Mm. It's no accident. Mm -hmm. I needed to know that. Mm -hmm. I needed to be a witness. I need to feel, I always feel, I need to feel uh, common jeopardy. Um, when I had cancer, and people said, why do you think you have cancer? Well, because I have all these students who have cancer and all these women who have cancer. I need to know. And when I was raped, I needed to know. Not abstractly. Yes. What is it that people are suffering? What is it that the earth is suffering? And so, um, and the books come out of it. Um, the book that I wrote, um, A Rain of Night Birds, mm -hmm. is about climatologists and it's set on the Four Corners Reservation mm -hmm. and also uh, the Yakima Reservation where um, Hanford is. Mm -hmm. And I think my books ask, if you look deeply at this, then what? Yeah. How do these people respond? How do these characters respond? And it's not me. The characters become real and I watch them. <laughs> and I dare say to a great extent, they say, leave this Western culture, leave Western mind. That's yes. what we have to do. Yeah. 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 Well, we are certainly experiencing the great consequences of Western hyper rational, hyper individualistic, hyper human centered um, right. thinking and living and acting in our institutions and everything else. And our ego and our eye, our yeah. big, big, big eye. Yeah. Yeah. You know, back when I spent a week, um, my first wife and I spent a week with Dolores LaChapelle uh, in Silverton, Colorado, along with um, George Sessions and Dave Abram and um, Max Olishlager. And it was a week long retreat in, um, in deep ecology and Dave Abram, David Abram is somebody whose work, um, reminds me, uh, of, of your own heart and, uh, your own heart mind approach okay. to the living world. Yeah. I'm curious, what does the word post doom bring to your heart and mind? How do you think of a phrase like post doom? Because, you know, this, this project, as I've envisioned, it actually has three prongs. There's the 87 or so on post-doom conversations that I've had, 
with people who get the big picture, including the scariest of the stuff, who've done the heart work and then come through to inspired uh, action, love and action, however love motivates them to be in action, and then can serve as mentors and exemplars for others. And then there's the posthume resources that I've just been collecting and creating over the last several years, which are sort of my my attempt to create a one-stop shop for some of the best things that I'm aware of in terms of helping people to process all this really challenging stuff emotionally, spiritually, uh, and doing so in relationship, in communication with others. So the post doom resources page. And so I'm curious, what does the word post doom bring to your heart and mind? How do you think of a phrase like post doom? Um, and then uh, what do you see as your own contributions, your own serving of life in these, these final years of your own life? Those are two different questions, but however you want to. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I want to say to you, post doom. I don't know. How about post doom? Here we are. Yeah, I'm, I'm un unfortunately, you can't get to post doom without going through a little bit of doom. So right. there's a whole bunch of people who are still in denial or anger or bargaining <laughs> or depression or whatever. Um, post doom really emerges with the acceptance and then the trust of the process. Uh, no. But yeah, post post doom, here we are. I like that. I mean, it's that here we are. Um I've been sponsoring something called Dare, which means council in the Shona language. Um, we used to meet here on the land till the pandemic. We meet on Zoom. Um, it's been going on since 1999, first Sunday of the uh, first Sunday of, after the new moon. It's a healing community. Uh, one session is dream telling. Yes. Um, I can't work anymore without asking people for their dreams mm. because I, I, we need wisdom beyond ourselves and the dreams come from elsewhere. They come from the dream spirits. And I also send people outside, go and go outside for an hour, make a sacred space. Even if, if it's a planter uh, on your stoop, whatever it is, have a place for the natural world, go outside and then and talk and listen. Don't yeah. talk. Listen, yeah, listen. Exactly, exactly. And then come back and we can talk with each other. Um, so what are the ways, all these things that you're doing, which in addition to how people are thinking how do we create real intimacy how do we create real interconnection in those i'm sure that happens in the women's group that women know each other and they meet again and again and again um so i was excited about our meeting I was like, I really, I really, I really was. Um, it feels important. This conversation feels important. It feels important because it feels like there's an intimacy to it, you know. Exactly. And, and that I am willing, and I think you are willing, to be altered by what we're saying to each other. And maybe that's one key for post-doom that we have to be willing to be altered by circumstances, by each other. We have to be willing to respond in caring about each other, not caring about ourselves, caring about each other. Your grandchild, my great-grandchild, um your vision you know matters 
um, Connie may listen to this. Oh, we will be connected. She's yeah. taking care of these trees. I can't believe it. I'm going to go and read what she's doing. <laughs> There's an intimacy. Uh, uh, I feel yes. like this woman loving these three people. Yes. And I mean, she, she even and, and says, she's saying, honey, I'm going to help you move north. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, her, her whole stance is whether we make it or not, I don't know, but I'm serving the trees. <laughs> Yeah. Right, right, and and she's take it, it's motherly. Yeah, she's it taking is. care of them. Yes. It, it, so a field gets created of consciousness, and it has some substance to it, and maybe. Maybe, 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 maybe. Yeah. But at least for the moment. Yes. At least for the moment, if we can stop our behavior first and then act in right relationship to each other. Yeah. If we're just doing things for ourselves and we're stop, not stopping our behavior, it doesn't matter. Exactly. So exactly. We have to change our lives must change our lives we get to change our lives <laughs> yeah yeah i think we get, we get to, to. those of us like those of us who are who are waking up or are fully awake to our predicament to our times both the tragedy and the the awesomeness uh mm -hmm. the, the sublime nature of these times um we get to fall more deeply in love. We get to serve something larger than ourselves. We get to serve each other. And we get to care for each other, almost like global hospice. We get to care for each other compassionately and generously um, in this process, this composting process. Yeah. And for me, and we get to serve the spirits. Yes. We get to listen. Yeah to what they say, however you understand those words and however the voices come right. to you. Yeah. And, and, you know, we get to do ceremony, get to yes. enact our relationship in a kind of formal way of acknowledgement of the wonder of it and making the bonds, making the connections. Ceremony with the tree, ceremony with the spirit, ceremony with the light, ceremony with the dead. You know. Yes, my greatest teacher in that regard was Dolores LaChapelle. Um, uh, her, her work, Sacred Land, Sacred Sex, Rapture of the Deep, and so much of her work was about embodying this love relationship with the land, this love relationship with the ecological reality of which we're a part and upon which we depend, and then ritualizing, ceremonializing that. She also had a real Taoist heart. And Stan Rushworth, of course, uh, I'm so gr glad that you mentioned him uh, earlier because Stan and, and Dar Jamel, their, their most recent work, but Stan has been such an amazing um, elder for so long. Um, right, right, yeah. Yeah, Stan's wow. well, my brother. That's yeah, really I, I have no doubt, I have no doubt. My... Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, going to Water is, is monumental novel i think one of the great novels of the last hundred years or so going to yes. water well it's interesting because i'm recording a, a program either later today or tomorrow that features among other things uh coming to water and i say that you know this is a really must read book in terms of understanding the indigenous uh, heart and mind yeah. here we go <laughs> yep, here we go well dina anything that you'd like to say to be uh, fully complete with this conversation this has really been wonderful, by the way. Thank you. No, very, very wonderful. Very beautiful. Um, I think we can't choose one thing. I think, you know, 
there's a range of things and ways that we have to begin to live. The natural world is complex, mm -hmm. interconnected and complex. And, and we have to follow that also. So all of it, all of it, bearing witness and um, ceremony and planting seeds and taking care of the trees and honoring life spirit exists and the animals are profoundly wise and intelligent the non-humans not only the animals and so we yield to that and thank you for your work thank you for your efforts for your devotion for your you know it matters thank you, really thank matters. you dear sister <laughs>